this. Good morning. Open your Bibles to Philippians. We are in Philippians chapter 2. Let me turn my Bible around. We're in Philippians chapter 2, y'all. There's Bibles in the back. Um, if you need one, follow along with us. We're in chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, don't own a Bible, um, it's yours. Take it with you. This little epistle, this wonderful book called Philippians, uh, we have given it the title Gospel Joy. As I said before, even in the midst of hardship, our eternal salvation is secure. Jesus is Lord. And whatever we're going through because of the gospel, we are known, we are loved, and we, know that, and, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who called according to his purpose. And we will rejoice in all things because of who Jesus is. So that's why we call it gospel joy. So let me read to you Philippians chapter 2. We are looking at verses 12 through 18 this morning. Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 through 18. So hear the infallible, authoritative word of God. Philippians 2, 12 through 18. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless And innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Beholding, uh, excuse me, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ, I, the Apostle Paul, may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Verse 17. Even if I am to be, even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Just a quick recap. Remember the Apostle Paul, church planting pastor, started the church in Philippi in Europe about 10 years earlier. But now he's under house arrest, chained to a Roman soldier day and night. Epaphrodites from Philippi brings him while in chains in Rome, a monetary gift. It also brings, I'm sure, good news, a joyful news on how the church in Philippi was doing. And Paul takes this opportunity then to to send back this letter that he's writing to Philippi by the hands of Epaphrodites. And he tells the church that he is filled with joy as he continually Praise for them, remembering their partnership, their, 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 their shared interest, their shared activity together in demonstrating, declaring the good news of the gospel. And how even while suffering on the Roman authority, chained for the gospel, he's rejoicing that the gospel is, is being advanced, the, the advancing of the gospel. And though he hopes to be released and, and he, to continue his work, among the church of Philippi, uh, uh, for the progress and joy of their faith of the gospel, he is committed. He is committed to Christ. He is committed while he's on this earth to serve Christ. Whether well, that means life or death. Chapter 1, verse 21. For to me, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. But meanwhile, he's not sure what the verdict will be. He's sharing his situation with the church, and he moves from the circumstance of his imprisonment and the, and the shared participation of the gospel and the advancement of the gospel. He goes from that situation to exhortation, chapter 1, verse 27. Only, he says, let your manner of life live as citizens, we talked about that, worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear that you're standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Paul tells them that walking, living, living as citizens worthy of the gospel, a life lived by and through the grace of God is seen, manifested by standing firm, by striving together, by being united together, having unity, unified around the gospel. And then he picks up in chapter 2, verse 1, and kind of shows us a little bit what that means. What does it mean to be unified? He says you have to be in Christ. Is there any encouragement in Christ? 
He said, you got to be, you got to be not only in Christ, you got to have the love of Christ. You got to have the unity of the Spirit. You got to receive mercy through Christ. You got to be single minded, as the verse continues in chapter two. Oneness of heart, soul, and mind. You got to have an attitude of humility if you want to walk in unity. Chapter two, verse three do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more important than yourself. Let each, chapter 2, verse 4, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. What he's saying is, if you want to have unity, you got to have humility. Humble attitudes as a church, willing to serve, to humble yourself and to serve one another. That takes us to chapter 2, verse 5, where he says, you know what that looks like? Yeah, let me show you an example of the, of, of the greatest uh, of humility, example of the greatest humility and obedience that has ever been displayed. It's the example of the Lord Jesus Christ in the gospel. He is voluntary, stepping out of heaven's glory, taking on humanity with, with the attitude and actions of a slave, of a servant, all the way down to death on a cruel and dreadful cross. Chapter 2, verse 6 was in the form of God, did not equality, count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, fully God, fully man. Chapter 2, verse 8, being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. There's your example. Verse 9, we see God's response. He super exalts the God-man, Jesus, therefore God has highly exalted him, bestowed upon him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the name he got, to the glory of God the Father. Verse 12, therefore, when you see therefore, you ask, what is therefore, therefore? Therefore, is pointing back. Therefore, I believe, is not only pointing back to verse 11, therefore, but I think therefore is pointing back actually to where, the, where, where really this section begins, and that's in chapter 1, verse 27, the exhortation to unity. Look, if you have your Bibles open, look with me the comparison of chapter 1, verse 27, to that of chapter 2, verse 12, our text. Look at it with me. Verse 27 of chapter 1 says, live worthy, live as citizens, live worthy of the gospel, verse 27. Chapter 2, verse 12 says, work out your salvation. So kind of, kind of saying the same thing in a different way. Live worthy of the gospel, walk this way, and then chapter 2, verse 12, work out your salvation. Chapter 1, verse 27, so that whether I come and, I'm, and I see you or I'm absent, whether I'm there or not, chapter 1, verse 27. Now look at chapter 2, verse 12. As you have always obeyed, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, whether I'm there or not. They're linked together. So he says, therefore, in verse 12, he's not only pointing back to verse 11, but he's pointing back to chapter 1, verse 27. And what is in between those two sections of Scripture? Chapter 1, verse 27, uh, ver- through chapter 2, verse 4. In our text this morning, what's, what, what's in between? It's the example of Christ. It, it is the gospel. Paul says, look at the, the sacrificial servanthood and obedience and death of Jesus as the pattern for your humble servanthood, putting others before you so that you can have unity. And now in verse 12, the gospel should be the process by which we go through. The key is the gospel that unlock, uh, unlocks this uh, enabling momentum that is necessary in our pursuit, in, a, in the process of following the great example of our obedient, suffering servant, Jesus the Christ. We have come full circle in this text We've come full circle in this text. We went from the exhortation to unity, only walk this way and seen through unity in chapter 1, verse 27, to the example of what that looks like in order to have unity, right? So, so from the exhortation to the example, and now he says, listen, here's the expectation. This is how you are to live it out through the sanctifying process 
of holiness and obedience, Christ-likeness. So you have the exhortation, you have the example, and now you have the expectation. So we're going to be talking about sanctification, and here's a three headings we're going to look at. Uh, the first one is the sanctifying work. Number two, the sanctifying witness, and finally the sanctifying joy. So that's where we're going. So number one, which will be the longest point of the of the three, because there's a lot here that I want to talk about. It's, it's really important we get chapter uh, chapter two, verse twelve and thirteen right before we move on. So Paul says, therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now not only as in my presence when I was with you, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Therefore, in light of the example I've just given you in Christ, so you remain humble, obedient, and unified, therefore, in light of that, obey. Beloved, obey as you, whether I'm there or not. Now, the word beloved in our text is in the plural. So before we get out to work out, he when he says to work out your own salvation, he starts out with the plural. In other words, he's saying to the church, listen, this ain't you and you alone. This is, this is for you all. This is for us collectively. This is for the church, the community, to obey God and together in some sense work out our salvation with fear and trembling. One's the hand, one's the foot. We need to work together. You got teachers, you got different aspects within the body that we are to be together working, obeying, and working together out our own salvation. So there's a plurality here where we do it together. But notice what he doesn't say. Paul does not say work in your salvation or work for your salvation or work toward your salvation or even work at your salvation. He says, work out your salvation. You can't work out your salvation unless God has already worked it in. He's talking about your sanctification, my sanctification, not your salvation. Work it out. Sanctification, Latin word is sanctus, Greek word hagiazo, literally means set apart, holy, other, Negatively, it means we've been set apart from sin. Positively, we've been set apart for God. There's a setting apart from sin. There's a consecration, a dedication, a set apart for God. Now, sanctification, many times when we talk about sanctification, we talk about the process. We're going to get there in a minute. But what you also need to know is that sanctification is also a noun and points to a one-time event. Colossians chapter 1 verse 13 says, God the Father has delivered us, his children, from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption and forgiveness of sin. There's a translation from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, to the kingdom of Jesus. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 The Apostle Paul lists a a long list of sinful lifestyles of people who will never inherit the kingdom of God. And then he writes, but that that, that was you. And such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit. So there's a sense where sanctified, you are you are set apart, regenerated. Positionally seated with Christ. You were snatched from the kingdom of darkness. You now belong to the kingdom of God because of the King Jesus who, whose substitutionary death on the cross, his atonement on the cross, his resurrection from the grave, his establishment of his kingdom, and his calling us into his family. We are no longer part of that kingdom. We are part of Christ's kingdom. Now, I don't want to be confused. Sanctification is an important biblical word if you've never heard it before. But so is the word Justification, another very important biblical word. It's all over scripture, very important. And I want to confuse sanctification with justification just for a moment. Let me just explain the two. Justification, when you read just or or justification, sometimes it's translated righteousness, it's a legal term used in a courtroom, in the holy courtroom of God. A one-time event where you were you were you were vindicated, you were you were made right, your sins have been forgiven. And the righteousness of Christ that is required to be in the presence of God has been counted to you or imputed to you by faith alone in Christ alone. That's the justification of God, our justification. 
Sanctification speaks of being set apart. Justification speaks of a new standing. Forgiven. Righteous imputed. Legally declared just. Vindicated. Okay, so there's a difference. And when we talk about sanctification, you have to understand that that, that time in which we were set apart from the world to God, it changed the trajectory of our life. Okay? It changed the direction of our life. And that's when we talk about sanctification, most of the time we talk about that direction, that momentum, that, that process of moving forward in the process of being more holy. Because when God sets us apart, listen, sometimes we're, we're a hot mess. But he's working in us. It's a process. Uh, sanctification as a process is when God is working in our lives to look more like Christ. It, it concerns maintaining and strengthening and developing Christ-like character. Growing in holiness. The Holy Spirit begins to work in us as we respond to the salvation that has already been given to us by grace. And we respond in action and conduct and enables us to look more like Jesus each day, each year as we progress in the faith. Romans 8, 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son. So the question in our text as well, is who does the sanctification? Does God do it or do we do it? Do we just say, let's just let go and let God? Or is there some responsibility that falls on us? Some people say that we are just to be passive in the process, that we are to just to be, to be Filled with the Spirit, yes, but to yield our lives to the Spirit, and God does the wreck. Well, are we, are we called to yield to the Holy Spirit? Absolutely. But what about verse 12? When it talks about obedience, it talks about working in your own, in your own sanctification. What about in 1 Corinthians 9 when Paul talks about, uh, use a metaphor for running a race, athletes exercising, a boxer in the, boxing in the air, someone who disciplines their body. Well, what about when Paul says to young Timothy, Pastor Timothy in 1 Timothy 4, he says to Timothy, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourselves for godliness. Train, gymnazo, exercise yourself for godliness. So it is our responsibility or is it God's responsibility? Yes. But how do we keep that in balance? Do we, because we just can't sit back and do nothing and do nothing and only yield as if it's going to magically happen. We're not going to grow in our sanctification. We're not going to be used of God. But, but for those doers like me, if you take it too far and it's about you working, 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 then as you're growing in your, in your, in your faith, you become self-righteous. I was that guy. And then if you don't do what you work, work, work for, and you fail, you become what? Distraught. Self-righteousness, superiority, or inferiority, right? I can never do anything right. So how do we keep the balance? This may shock you. The gospel. The gospel. The work of God, that he alone saves, he alone awakens the heart, he alone liberates the heart, he alone opens our eyes to see the beauty and the glory and the majesty of Jesus, he alone allows us to, 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 to see that beauty, to repent of our sins, and to trust in the perfect life, atoning work of Jesus. And we, we, don't, we don't see that beauty and glory and then go, all right, yeah, I'm just going to sit back and do nothing. And nor do we say, you know what, I have to work really, really hard to please God because if I don't, then he'll hate me and he'll reject me and, and he'll want nothing to do with me. That's not the gospel either. The gospel says, look at Jesus, chapter 2, verse 6 through following. Look at Jesus. L look to him who left his rightful place in glory, humbled himself, and in obedience to the Father, humbled himself all the way down to death on the cross, and therefore he was highly exalted as Lord and Savior, and by grace alone, through faith alone, we can have salvation alone in Christ alone for sinners like you and me. Therefore, because of God's grace in the gospel, we do the work not for our salvation, but because of our salvation. Remember, Hebrews taught us that the new covenant, in the new covenant, God places his spirit in us. 
He, he writes, remember we learned in Hebrews? He writes his law on our hearts. He writes them on our minds. And, and he gives us the desire to, to follow him, to obey his, 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 his commands. First John says that they're not burdensome. The Holy Spirit gives us a new heart, new desires to obey God and serve God. Not perfectly, not perfectly. And that's where the sanctifying process comes in. We're growing. Our new nature and our new desires that were given to us at regeneration, being born again, works itself out because our minds, our bodies, our impulses, our desires are, are, still, being, are, are still being led in many ways by our sinful nature. Sanctification is when that new nature, the, the new heart, the new desires starts changing the mind, starts changing the desires, starts changing the impulses. That's what sanctification is all about. Getting us, getting everything under the lordship of Christ. That's what sanctification is. And Paul says, as you will always obey, continue to obey, whether I'm there or not, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, Paul's exhortation is clear. Obey God, right? I'm, whether I'm there or not, you need to continue to obey God, not not for their salvation, but because of their salvation. And obey, look what it says, to work out their own salvation. Now, the word work there in chapter 12, chapter 2, verse 12, the word work is an interesting verb form. It means to work towards something or to continue on with something until it's completed, until it's fulfilled. You've got a mathematical problem. You've got a problem. You're going to work it out until you find the answer. It was used in antiquity of, of, of a mine, that someone would go in the mine and, 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 and bring out all the valuable minerals and, and material in the mine. It's, it's bringing it to completion. The completion, of course, and the goal is Christ-likeness. And Christ-likeness is it the perfect likeness of Jesus lived out in our life. It won't happen on this earth. It's something we're working toward. It's the goal. And we know, and, you know it won't be, it's not going to be finally and fully realized until we're glorified, transformed bodies. We leave this planet and we see him face to face, the glorification of the saints. But now, but for now, believers are responsible to actively pursue a life of obedience, of working in the sanctifying process. And we do that, and we don't have time to get into it, through disciplines, um, Bible studies, Corporate worship, serving, giving, evangelism, other habits found in Scripture. Um, I, I brought some books. I don't usually do this, but I thought I'd write. The, you know, Discipline of Grace by Jerry Bridges, God's Role and Our Role in the Pursuit of Holiness. Uh, Spiritual Disciplines, Donald Whitney is a great book. You know, Celebration of, Dis uh, of Discipline, Richard Foster. And there's books like that that teach you know, how to, to develop good disciplines in order to grow in your faith in Christ. But here's the deal. You gotta keep your eyes on the cross. Because even growing in the grace and knowledge of Christ, sometimes because our, our Luther said it, you know, it, it, that self righteousness is our default mode, default mode of every heart. And all of a sudden, look how good I'm doing. But that doesn't mean we don't stop growing, learning, being involved with habits that. Help us to grow in the knowledge of Christ. We just got to keep the gospel that we are desperately wicked, that Christ had to die for our sins, but we are loved and valued, and he was glad to do so. We have to keep the gospel at the center of our sanctification. But also look at this. It's not only persistent, but it's a particular motive. Look, fear and trembling. Fear and trembling. Living in the reverence of God. What a way to combat selfish ambition and conceit by living in the awareness of the holiness of God, propelling us to live holy lives. The fear and trembling that the Bible talks about for believers is not terror, since we have secure refuge in Christ. We have found refuge in Jesus we have to live in awe of him now. 2 Corinthians 5, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others, Paul writes. Proverbs 9, 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Whenever I talk about fear, the fear of God, there's just going to be so much going on in your minds this morning that I, that I just have to take a moment and just say there's a difference between the fear of, of walking with the Lord as believers and those who are not Christians. The fear of the Lord for the believer is not horror, and terror of being in the presence of someone who will hurt you and harm you, but the humble awareness 
of being in the presence of greatness, of perfection, of magnificence. There's a difference. So years ago, um, well, it's been a while now, maybe even 10 years, not quite sure. My family and I took our daughters and we went to the Grand Canyon. And if you've been to the Grand Canyon, it is... It is magnificent sight, breathtaking, just awe. It looks like, it literally looks like it's been painted in the sky. It's just, it's just unbelievable. But when we pulled over, you see this awesome sight. It's almost like breathtaking. Our daughters get out of the car, and they're running toward the edge. There's no railings. I don't know why there's no railings, but there's no railings. They're running after their aunt that, their aunt that was there, and they're running, and they're running, and they have flip-flops on. And I get out of the car, like, yelling and screaming. Like, I was like, I see them get caught with a flip-flop in, like, Grand Canyon. <laughs> That's a different kind of fear. There's a breathtaking fear, and then there's a horror. As believers, we are in awe of God. Psalm 130, verse 3 says this, very interesting. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Lord, if you were to mark my iniquity, if you were to hold me accountable to my sin and my rebellion against you, who could stand? Nobody. Verse 4. If you, O Lord, should mark our iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? That's verse 3. Verse 4. But with you, Lord, there is forgiveness. Like, ah, oh, that's awesome. Who could stand? No one. You're, uh, my rebellion, my sin, I am done before you. But you know what? With you there is forgiveness so that, the scripture continues, Psalm 130, you may be feared. Feared. Not the more I'm scared of your anger, the more I fear you. The more I experience your love and your forgiveness, the more I fear you. How does that happen? Because for believers, the fear of the Lord is not being afraid he's going to beat you and condemn you. It's to fear and awe of him as you grow in the awareness of his holiness the awareness of his holiness, the awareness of your sinfulness, all together looking at the cross, at the gospel. Dear family, that will bring you on your knees to worship our God in awe. So sanctification will grow as you sense that deep need for forgiveness and, and how God supplies his love and grace necessary for that need. Fear and awe is then seen by your desire to not grieve or dishonor the one who gave his life for you that you so desperately need. Worship, awe, wonder. And in the presence of our loving, forgiving, great and awesome holy God, let us in humility and selfless service, selfless service and sacrifice work out our own salvation. But how? Verse 13, God's enabling grace. For it is God who works in you both to will and to work of his good pleasure. Verse 13 is the cause, the initiating, the enabling power. Now, the word work in verse 13, there's two of them, works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure, is a different word than that in verse 12, bringing to completion. That word, both of them in verse 13, is a word that means to be energized. It means to, to have energy. It's referring to God's power enabling us and working in us. And notice the play on words that Paul is saying here. Paul is saying that God is energizing you, God who works in you, so that by his energy and enabling power, you can work, be energized for his good pleasure. Notice how God moves our desires to become aligned to his will, to, to will, to, to want to do it, and then how he works according to his good pleasure. I want you to see that, very important. It is God who motivates, it is God who gives us the ability to work for his good pleasure. God is not merely strengthening your will, <laughs> strengthening our will, and somehow working together. He's changing our will. D.A. Carson says this, God himself is working in us both to will and to act. He works in us at the level of our wills and at the level of our doing, end quote. 
So in some sense, there's really not uh, the synergism going on here where, where our will along with God will, God's will is, is working together for our sanctification. That's not what it says. It is God alone who is causing. It is God alone who is working. It is God alone that is energizing us to work into will of his good pleasure. Right? Unless you put gas in the car, it's not going to run. John 15, 4, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So, whether, so neither can you unless you abide in me. After changing our motives, he gives us the power to work. Now, I'm not denying, as we talked about in verse 12, I'm not denying our responsibility, our part. We saw that in verse 12. But what this text is telling us, very important, is that without God's power in our life, we're trying to turn that wheel in our car without turning it on. This text tells us that God energizes both the believer's desires and their actions. So when we become Christians, we have new desires. We have, we, have new, uh, we have a new will. He changes us, and he wants us to love. He gives us the heart that wants to love the things he loves. And God alone is able and willing to do that. And look what it says. It's just, for it is God who energizes us, in us, both to want to do, and he energizes us to do the work for his good pleasures. The sanctifying work of God is, is, yes, for our good, but ultimately it's for his glory, his pleasure. He wants us to think and do what pleases him. Good pleasure is a, it's a word that expresses great enjoyment, satisfaction in him. Many of you know John Piper's famous quote, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. God is most glorified in us he is seen as the great incalculable worth and value that he is. God has most glorified us when we are most satisfied in him, trusting, relying on him alone. God energizes, God excites, God empowers for his pleasure and his enjoyment. And family, when God gets glory, we get joy. So as we go to our next point, let me just ask this question. Don't answer it out loud. You guys can talk about it in community groups, if you'd like to. If, is glorifying God, is making much of him, is, is the pleasure of God living your life to the supremacy of God, is that important to you? If you, you know what, I'm, I'm, I think nothing of living in pleasures of God or, or the supremacy of God, making him known and what he pleases him. If, that, if that's you this morning, I would ask you to simply put a curtain around your heart. Paul's warning in 2 Corinthians 13, examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. Test yourself. Or do you not realize this about yourself, that Jesus Christ is in you? The, the reason why I say that is if Christ is in you, this is what he's doing. And if you can't identify with this, then my, 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 my encouragement to you is put a curtain around your heart. And say, Lord, do I really belong to you? Have I really trusted in you? Have I, have I really been to the place of confessing my sins and receiving the free gift of eternal life in your son? Because God's doing this work in you, the sanctifying work, the sanctifying witness. Do all things without grumbling or disputing, right? So work out your salvation, fear and trembling. Uh, God is working in you, will and do it with good pleasure. And what does that look like? Do all things without grumbling. <laughs> Stop your whining, right? The word grumbling is a Greek word, resembles its meaning, like beep or bang. It means to mutter, to complain. Someone once said it's, uh, it's discontent on the street corner. Notice what Paul doesn't say. Try to work out your grumbling once in a while, when you feel like it, when it's inconvenient, or when you're very irritated. No, he says all things, all, all, all the time. Do all things. Every situation, every place, every inconvenience, and every irritation. Because grumbling really, when you boil down, if, if, you're, if you're a grumbler and you're constantly grumbling, don't look at the person next to you, okay? It's really the rejection of God's circumstances in your life, right? Paul already demonstrated that even though God has had him in chains, he chose to not complain but to rejoice, rejoice. 
in his circumstances. Why? Because he, he knew the plan of God. God had placed him there, and the goal of his life was Christ and sharing Christ, and that was being fulfilled in a way that he probably couldn't even dream of until he was in chains and in Rome. If we're constant complainers, then we're really saying, God, you don't know what you're doing, you don't know what you're doing, and you really dropped the ball on this one. Paul, a Pharisee, a Jew, uh, knew that, and knew his Bibles, knew his Old Testament, that the children of Israel in the Old Testament had turned grumbling into like this Olympic sport. They grumbled and complained when they saw the chariots of the Egyptians coming after them at the Red Sea. God just delivered them by this awesome way, and they're complaining. They grumbled at Marah, where the water was bitter. They murmured, murmured in the wilderness when they had no food. They murmured, murmured at uh, Rephidim when they had no water. They grumbled at Kadesh Barnea when the spies said, you know, there are giants in the land. On and on and on. And the truth is that ultimately all grumbling... All grumbling really is directed toward God. Directed to God. In fact, in fact, in Numbers 16, God intervenes and says through Moses, oh, Moses says to them, it's against the Lord that you and your followers have banded together. Who is Aaron that you would grumble against him? Don't blame Aaron. God brought us here. 14,000 people died in the wilderness. So before we just judge the Israelites, man, a bunch of crybaby complainers, let's relate. Do we complain? And not, and only, it not only denies the sovereignty of God, but it disrupts unity. It really does. It's the opposite of 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Therefore, whether you eat or drink, do everything, do whatever you do, do everything for God's glory. That's the opposite of that. He says, do not... Do all things without grumbling and disputing. Disputing means to argue. It's when, when, when the grumbling goes from our head to our heart, out our mouth. Right? It moves, it moves and, 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 and it comes out of our lips. I heard a story this week about a man who was late for dinner, got home at 6 o'clock, said he was going to be home at 5, he got home at 6. Immediately his wife started complaining, arguing, led to an intense argument for two hours. Husband and wife arguing for two hours. Nothing worked. Finally, finally, the husband just said, honey, we're not getting past this. I got, I got an idea. Let's start over. Let's just start over. Let me just pretend I'm just getting home. So he steps outside. He opens up the door, and she says, really? It's 8 o'clock. You're just getting home? <laughs> Do not be the argumentative type. Why? Verse 15. So that you may be blameless, innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Paul wrote these words because he knew that complaining and arguing all the time not only denies the sovereignty of God and disrupts the unity, but complaining and arguing and, and murmuring can discredit our testimony. It doesn't influence anyone for Christ. Blameless means without fault, innocent, pure, unmixed. Blemish refers to a sacrifice, that which is spotless or doesn't have any blemish on it. And Paul says, listen, act like the children of God that you are. Be honest, be pure. We live in a crooked world, a word actually twisted, scoliosis, where uh, curvature of the spine. We live in this broken, twisted, jacked up generation. Act like children. I also believe that Paul had, because he's, he's a Pharisee, he, he knew his Old Testament. He had Deuteronomy 32.5 in the back of his mind, which says this. They have acted, the people of God, the children of Israel, they have acted corruptly toward God. They are not his children because of their defect, but are a perverse and crooked generation. What, what Moses was saying, he's looking at these people and saying, look, act like children. Stop acting like the world. Stop acting like you belong to this, to this twisted, jacked up, corrupted world. And Paul's saying the same thing here. Listen, act as children, children of God. And by God's enabling grace, don't allow the world to pour, uh, to pour their mold into you. Don't be complainers. Stand on conviction. God's sovereign, God's provision, God's providence. We are his children. We've been saved by grace. 
loved unconditionally, loved eternally, and therefore walk in truth and be, walk, what he says, without blemish. And that doesn't mean perfect. It doesn't mean perfect. It means without blaring inconsistencies of continually arguing and grumbling and complaining. And how do we do that? Again, the gospel. The gospel tells us that we are far better off than we deserve, considering what we deserve and what we got and what we didn't get, and understanding the greater truths of the gospel will help us not to go down that hole of complaining and murmuring. That's what happened to the Israelites. They were delivered from Egypt by the mighty hand of God. And they forgot all that. And they were murmuring, how much greater from the exodus we came through in bondage to sin, to death, and hell, and how through the perfect life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus brought us out of that. Believers should not only be blameless in their example, shining in their appearance. Among them, look what it says, you shall shine as lights in the world. A metaphor of character. Where does, when does, I should say, when do lights shine the brightest? When it's the darkest, right? Believers are to be bold and bright, shining examples in a dark world that's getting family darker and darker and darker. I'm not trying to be political. It's just a reality. If we want to shine as stars and lights in the gospel, we have to be careful and resist temptation to grumble. And therefore, when we're talking with people, we won't lose our, our distinctiveness and effectiveness with the gospel. What an impact we would have in a world that's pointing fingers at everybody else. They did it. She did it. His fault. Their fault. Everybody's fault. If we would stand and trust God. Trust God. And allow God to achieve his purposes in our life. And we'll become witnesses to the world. Paul is saying to the church in Philippi and to the church in King's Chapel... He wants us to be a proclaiming church, not a complaining church. And we don't have one here, I'm thankful. But he wants to remind us of that. We move from the spotlessness to the shining, look to sharing. Holding fast, verse 16, to the word of life. So that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in Vain, literally holding out the good news. It's, it's a picture of, of someone holding something out. It, it, in non-religious circles, the holding uh, an offering of wine to a guest. It's, it's not our job. Listen, it's not our job to save people. That's Jesus' job. It's not our job to make people believe the gospel. That's the Holy Spirit's job. But it is our job to hold out the gospel. A young salesman was disappointed and lost a big sale. And as he talked and complained with his sales manager, he said, I guess it just proves you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And the manager replied, son, take my advice. Your job is not to make him drink. Your job is to make him thirsty. Our lives should be so filled with Christ by his enabling power and by his grace that when God begins to work in other people's hearts, it will produce a thirst for the gospel. It's all of God. And when we shine, we give, God the, uh, we give others the gift of God's word. We give testimony of the beauty and the glory and the work of Jesus. And they'll hear what we have to say. And then Paul says, listen, I want, I want to run this race. I want to run in such a way that it's not for nothing, that it's not in vain. I want to be proud when I see you again of what God is doing. This is not a, look how great I'm doing, I'm the apostle Paul. No, he said, look, to live is Christ, to die is gain. It's not about Paul. It's not about him being selfish. It's about him having hope in Christ and the gospel and to see the people that he loved, that he, that he gave his life for, that he has, uh, uh, had planted this church to live in such a way that the gospel is being proclaimed. And, and, and family, as I finished up this point, as I was closing in my, in, my, in my study, I thought, isn't that the way our community group leaders are? Isn't that the way your pastor elders and your deacons are? For the most part, we want to be proud, not in the sense of how great we've done, but to see you walking in truth, to see you delivered, to see you walk in the glory and the beauty of the gospel, to see you grow and transform into the image of Christ. That's our desire, too. And we're proud of so many people that have done, that have really just grown and exploded in, in their love for Jesus. So we have the, the sanctifying work, the sanctifying witness, and now the sanctifying joy. Even, Paul says, 
If I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I'm glad and rejoice with you all. Paul changes the image now from from running and working to to the sacrificial offering, from from labor and endurance to actually giving of his life. And notice he's not complaining. He's saying it's with joy, all joy. And Paul's leading by example. Now, in the Old Testament, when the people of Israel would come to the temple, come to the, the place of worship, they would bring a sacrificial offering. And the offering would come, they would, they would, the blood would be shed as a picture of, 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 of sin and the need for, for atonement. And the blood would be offered. And, the, and they would bring the offering to the, to, to the place with fire, uh, to the altar. And they would lay the animal on it and it would be burned up. Then they would take what's called a libation offering. It's, it's usually a pitcher of water, of wine, many times of wine. And they would pour it on the offering. And when they did that, the, the, this, it's called a drink offer, libation offering. The vapors and the mists and the steam from, this, from, this, from the wine being poured on this offering was symbolic as it raised up, as it lifted up to the heavens toward God. It was, it was symbolic of that. That's what Paul is saying. He's saying, I'm being poured out. The verb is continually being poured out as a drink offering and the Philippians church, to, to the ministry of the Philippians. I, I'm glad, I'm happy, I'm rejoicing as the gospel's being advanced and I'm being poured out for the ministry. Just like Jesus, self-emptying himself, being poured out. Paul is the one being poured, but look at the sacrifice. He says, I'm being poured out as a drink offering upon what? The sacrificial offering of your faith. The sacrificial offering of your faith. So I want you to get this vision just for a moment. The Philippian church were the priests who were bringing the sacrifice of their faith. And Paul's coming alongside and being the pouring of, the, of this, the, this libation offering upon the sacrifice. Now the, the pouring is secondary. The primary thing that's going on is that sacrifice. And I think Paul is using this imagery uh, and, and terminology to reveal his humility, right, about his own importance. He's saying, look, I'm secondary. I'm being poured out upon that sacrifice of your faith, your love and worship and, and, and advancement of the gospel. And I want you to catch this. I want, I want you to, Paul's saying, look, I know you have concern for me. I know you love me. I know you sent gifts more than once for my help. And yes, I'm being persecuted. I might even die for the faith. But you know what? That's not the main thing. You're the main thing. Your faith is the main thing. Your love for Jesus. I want to see you worshiping and wondering and awe of Christ. That's, that's the main thing. He's following the Lord's example, is he not? He, he viewed the Philippian sacrifice and service of faith as a cause of mutual rejoicing. As Christ is being known, Christ is being glorified, Christ is being worshipped. Isn't that community, right? So we pour out our lives, we serve one another, we love one another, we're home with one another, all for what? The glory of God. And once again, true to Paul, <laughs> it's a cause to rejoice. Look at verse 17b. I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. The antidote for grumbling for Paul was joy. Joy comes when we sacrifice our lives for the sake of the gospel. Paul views the suffering and service that, that we humbly do for each other as a doorway to deeper joy in Christ, a, a, a mutual joy accompanying service and humble service toward one another. Paul followed this Christ-like example. Paul's a shining light in a, in a crooked and twisted world. Christ, Paul had a, a true assessment of himself do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. He's following Christ. Count each other's more significant. He's following Christ. And get by his own example on what he's teaching. Look out not only for your own interests, but also the interests of others. That's what Christ did in the gospel. And here's Paul saying, I'm following Christ. Now, what's interesting about this text, if you look with me in verse 17b and 18, the word glad, there's two words, there's glad mentioned twice and rejoice mentioned twice. The word glad is the word joy, and the word rejoicing is just, it has a, 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 an addition to it. So what he's saying is, I am joyful 
and rejoice with you. So I am joy, I have joy, and, I, and, and, and I'm, I'm in joy, I, I have joy over you. Then he says, likewise, you should also have joy and be rejoicing with me. Joy, 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 joy. Like a little redundant, don't you think, Paul? Are you trying to make a point? Paul is joyful because it's become evident that God was using him to bring the Philippians to their goal of surrendered and sanctified life. He rejoices with them uh, as they experience the joy of redemption, the joy uh, of gospel, gospel joy, the joy of Christ. And for Paul, let me tell you, the greater the sacrifice for the gospel, the greater the sacrifice, the greater the joy. You know, sometimes we serve, and we get pleasure out of things we do, and we, as we should. We may serve at a benefit of something that we get that's great. We may serve and, and find joy in serving others, but how many times are we energized with great joy in sacrificing for the cause of Christ and the gospel? You know, the Apostle Paul looked to Christ, his person and his work, and by grace alone he recognized that salvation was had and, and given to him through Christ alone. And now Paul embraces the truth about Christ, his humble condescension, condescension from glory. Christ's humble servanthood as he takes on humanity and takes on uh, uh, humanity yet without sin and dies a cruel and brutal death on the cross. Paul understood that. And Paul followed the example of Christ. Paul looked at the gospel and then Paul not only did that, but recognizing that our sanctification, the process by which we become more like Jesus, is also of grace. Also of grace. Do you know, if Christ found you where you were, where I was, broken, in a twisted and broken world, in that dark place in our life, if he found us, or he rescued us from the place we were at and left us where we were, that would be a cruel thing to do. Would it not? Do you realize how empty it would be if Christ rescued us by grace and did not empower us for the purpose of which he created us for? The display of his glory that is ultimately seen in the gospel? Gospel joy comes when we bow our knee and we confess Jesus as Lord, as my sufficient, all-satisfying treasure. Now I will live my life by his enabling grace, growing in faith, growing in my love, growing in making him known to others in the sufficiency and worth that he is to the world. I'm, I'm going to grow by that grace. I'm going to live in humble obedience and sacrificial service to others. That's what Paul is saying. That's the work of sanctification. So as the band comes up, let me read to you one last thing I wrote as, as uh, I finished up studying. Actually, I wrote this this morning. What is sanctifying joy? This is what I wrote this morning. Sanctifying joy is simply this. Humbly live in unity by looking to Christ's humble and obedient work in the gospel. And by that same gospel, work out your salvation with reverence and awe. Live life as a shining witness to a dark world by not grumbling, but holding out the gospel, the word of life, and rejoicing together through our sacrificial service for God's glory revealed and demonstrated in the gospel. In the gospel. That's the encouraging word for you this morning, that we live our lives in the grace of the power and the energy of Christ and that we pour out our lives sacrificing for the glory of Christ and the advancement of the gospel. Father, thank you so much for, the, for not leaving us where we were but rescuing us, delivering us, forgiving us and then empowering us, your naval grace, to change to be more like Jesus each and every day. And Lord, not only that, but empowering us and enabling us, Lord, to live in a way of, of humble obedience, sacrificially giving of our lives so that Christ would be glorified. The gospel will go out and you will get glory. Help us to do that, we pray, by your grace, by your power. In Jesus' good name, amen.